Assalamu alaikum, Ms. Al Khair. Uh, good evening. My name is Ibrahim Saleh. I'm a neurosurgeon and we are transmitting live from here in Man Jordan at the uh, Medical Campus. This uh, backdrop is the first Mercedes in Georgia and in Palestine by Tawfid al -Hur. This is Tawfid al and his son. And he brought the first Mercedes to this area of the world, 1922. And he used to bring these Mercedes in return for the uh, Jaffa oranges, which are, as you know, world famous. Uh, this is 1966. This is late King Hussein receiving some of the female teachers visiting him in the palace. The presentation for today is the unusual case of a powerful sign, parasigital motor strip lesion. We discuss the clinical, the logical, operative, and pathological correlation. So you heard me talking about powerful sign, which is the folks, parasigital. So let's look at this, the folks, the sagittal sinus, and the motor strip. This is the folks. The folks is a dural fold separating two hemispheres. <coughs> exactly the line starts in the front here, and then goes back and joins the tinterium cerebral line. So it separates the right from the left. The tinterium cerebral line separates the infra and the supratinturium. So you have one infra compartment, you have two supratinturium compartments. Uh, this uh, tough fibrous uh, membrane, uh, as you see, it has longitudinal fibers and also oblique fibers, so it is really tough. You need a knife to cut it. And in this, you'll find grooves with some blood visitors. The thing is this, that it is not sometimes complete. Sometimes you'll find some fenestrations in it, defects. And you have to be careful as a surgeon about this point. So the dura comes this way. This is coronal section. It divides into two parts, this part and this part. Also the dura in this area divides into two parts, this part and this part. These two parts join together to form the forks, and this cavity is the superior sagittal sinus. So the venous system of the brain is made of the sinuses and the veins. Sinuses, veins, superficial or deep, the posterior fossa veins are separate entities, so they are mentioned on their own. Dural sinuses, the superior sagittal sinus, the inferior sinus, straight sinus, sigmoid sinus, sphenoparietal sinus, cavernous sinus, superior vitrosal sinus, and inferior vitrosal sinus. There they are, this is the line cut section. You can see the superior <coughs> sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, and the straight sinus. This is a 3D picture, the folks. On the top there is the severe sagittal sinus. And in field over here is the inferior sagittal sinus. <coughs> inferior sagittal sinus will join the straight sinus. Severe sagittal sinus will go to a confluence of sinuses. Straight sinus on this side, straight sinus on this side. And in here, superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, straight sinus, transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus. And here you'll see the internal cerebral veins and vein of Rosenthal. <coughs> Superior sagittal sinus, and you can see the veins going into it in this direction. The, the blood flow is this way. So why are these veins going to the opposite direction? Because if they go this way, the minute you stand, you lose all your blood and you will die. So the Creator God, the Lord, made this, this direction so that there are valves here that your blood uh, return or venous return will be slowed, slowed down. Here is the inferior sagittal sinus. Here is the thalamus straight vein, septal vein, internal cerebral vein, done by vein of presental straight sinus. This is the vein of lave, and this is the cavernous sinus giving the inferior retrosal sinus. Again, 3D view, superior sagittal sinus, transverse sinus, transverse sinus, sigmoid sinus. Here is the cavernous sinus on both sides, giving the superior torsal sinus. This is the basal vein for basal sinus. 
So the Swiss that science is this cavity, small cavity, between the two poles of the dura in the midline. This is the, we have removed the bone, we are looking at the dura and the Swiss digital sinus. Remove the dura and you'd be left with the superior sagittal sinus. And again, you would notice that the veins join the sinus this way, though the blood is this way. As I said, if it was this way, you would die immediately. So they would go this way, uh, slow it down, then involves here, and then they join the superior sagittal sinus. Looking anteriorly uh, from the left, from right side or from the left side, it is just the same. There is always an angle. They don't join it completely straight. Here, I want you to concentrate on this. So people think that there is a vein that will go and go into the sinus. Wrong. Look at this vein. Passing parallel to the sinus and then going into it. You may think this is the edge of the sinus. And here, this vein going this way to this angle. So there are so many variations, <coughs> and we can only know that by doing the venogram before surgery. That's why I believe strongly that umbar eye is not enough. Umbar eye is part of umbar A and umbar B. The three constitute one image. Again, the sinus could have different forms. Look at this, called venous lakes. Look at the venous lakes here, or venous lakes here, or venous lakes here. Totally different. So this is the most dangerous area of your body. This is posteriorly, this is the sagittal sinus, joint the transfer sinus, the sigmoid sinus, this is cerebellum. And here, there is an area which is the void of these bridging veins, which can be used safely. Beautiful paper from China, 2007. The dural entrance of several bridging veins. How do they enter? As I said, with, with an angle. Look at this angle. This way going this way, and then going this way. So this is the sinus, and this is the angle between the two. Always acute angle. Why am I mentioning this? Because you will see it in our surgical video. So the veins that join the severe surgical sinus, we have the frontal, uh, the front, uh, front orbital, we have the uh, uh, group of uh, sinus of a group of veins, anterior, middle, and posterior. And at the central sulcus, we have a pre-sulcus, sulcus, posterior sulcus, and then the parietal, anterior, and posterior, and then the occipital, and the internal cerebral vein. Some <coughs> of our residents, or newly graduate surgeons, know this anatomy. None. Because it is not requested from them. To, the venous system is nothing. So you can cut and do anything you like with it. The cavernous sinus, sending the inferior petrosal sinus and the severe petrosal sinus, vein of lave, and so on. Thalamus triate, septal vein, antenna cerebral vein, vein of Rosenthal, vein of gallon, straight sinus. So, the superficial cerebral veins, which is the severe, going to the severe cerebral group, as I said, are frontal pole and frontal, which is anterior, middle, and posterior, the sulcal, the pre, center, and post the parietal, the anterior and posterior, the occipital, and you have these anastomotic veins. The main one is the anastomotic vein of Trollard. <coughs> Here you may think this is an anastomotic vein of Trollard. But look at the variations. We don't have Trollard here. It's a primitive one, while the pre sulcal vein is quite very prominent. So, so are so many variations in this. So reading from a book called the Greenberg is disaster because this is a book that was written by a resident to prepare him for the exam. So he was reading textbooks, major textbooks, and then making his abbreviations for the exam. The problem and the tragedy and the crime is that residents are asked to read Greenberg. This is a crime. It's a book for exams not for knowledge. If you read Greenberg, you will not know anything about this. Look at this, common trunk, joining all the veins into one trunk. If you damage this, this is the end of the patient. So the main anastomotic veins are the vein of the large, the great vein of Sambian fissure, 
and variable again. These are the three ones. They are called anastomotic. Why? Because the anastomos is superficial with the deep system. Again, there are variations. This is a paper paper from Canada, 2009, showing you the differences. This is the vein of the blood, vein of the bay, same fissures. Different from here. Different from this. This is the blood and Serbian. Vein of the bay is primitive. And so on. So, very, very much variations in this. The deep cerebral veins are the internal cerebral vein, vein of horizontal, internal central vein, the central vein, and gamma. This is a beautiful picture, and I really regret any resident uh, that in me of not seeing this picture in Yazagi. Reading textbook is the essence. Uh, Yazagi is made of five volumes, mainly five volumes. Uh, recently, I think they have made six. I did not finish reading them until this minute. So huge. But starting reading them when you are resident, you may finish them before you die. But don't read from green. Beautiful picture, 3D. What, what do you need more? Internal cerebral vein? Internal cerebral vein. Thalamus tail vein with the anterior caudal, middle caudal, posterior uh, 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 vein, uh, caudate vein, sorry. And this is the septal vein. <coughs> they join together with vein of Rosenthal, like this. Vein of Rosenthal starts from the frontal temporal and then comes this way. And this is here, you join with vein of Lavey. This is the septal, this is the, uh, the forks cerebral eye, the tentorium sorry, with these the sinuses inside. Internal cerebral vein starts here, the front of Monroe. Thalamus state and septal vein, internal cerebral vein, and then they can join vein of Gallen and vein of Rosenthal. Cerebral veins are separate entity. This is occipital view. Many veins draining into the sinuses. You should know that exactly where they are and which one you can or you cannot sacrifice. We will come to that in a minute. And the most important is the superior vitreous vein or vein of Dandy. This is the pineal gland and this. The arrangement of the veins here, you cannot do pioneer tumors unless you know this arrangement. So this is the value of the venogram. This is the venogram. And I hope that some of the technicians from the X-ray department are here today. Do we have any technician from our X-ray department? None. Although we request them to come so that we can tell them our notes. In front of our Shaban, how do you have the technicians? Anyway, so this is the arrangement of these veins and the sinuses and so on. And I used to give a common questions. I put this figure and I say, what is eight? Or what is 10? And see whether these residents know. None of them knew. So this is the inner brand. And when you study it, you would know what exactly is happening. So you know that there's a vein here. And you would like to know what that is exactly. But this is the accepted renal gland. And I will show you some of miserable renal glands. Then in this hospital and in other hospitals. We should not accept this level of renal glands or pictures. So if there is obstruction of the severus digital sinus, you would see the draining veins. And when there is a partial obstruction, there is always a vein anterior and one posterior. Sometimes they are surrounding it. Sometimes they are ahead of it and behind it. And sometimes you get this. And this is called the false or calcine sinus. Again, how many of our neurosurgeons in this part of the world know about anything about the calcine sinus? So, papers, Italy, 2005, role of contrast enhanced MRI venography, which is this one, comparison to see with the severe surgical sinus. Where are the veins surrounding the obstruction? You cannot go for surgery without studying this. Not only to hang it in the room, but actually know it, know exactly what are you facing. 
tumor, parasitated, causing obstruction of the sinus. Not complete obstruction because still you can see the flow. Here there is complete obstruction. Again, veins, almost complete obstruction. You can see the veins. Tumor completely obstructing, and you can see the flow. Another obstruction in the veins. So, fun sign, sinus. It is like the straight sinus, like this. And usually, when the image we have for sinus, sinus, usually there is a problem with the straight sinus. In this view, both are a normal individual. Straight sinus, straight sinus. So, for sinus, sinus, and straight sinus. So, for sinus, sinus is also can be present in normal individual. How is that? In utero, in the 20 weeks, when there is still nothing, God create the folks and put some plexus here. This plexus of veins go up and form the superior sagittal sinus or go down and form the inferior sagittal sinus. This should end the youth by the time you are born. Sometimes they persist. So it's called persistence of, uh, of the folks uh, fork sinus. So Falcine sinus is a persistence of congenital venous channels within the folds which closes at birth. They could be normal, they could be associated with some abnormalities or obstruction. Anatomy of the Falcine venous plexus, from where? Imagine USA and Iran. So in science, there are no views. There are friends and people, researchers who work together. Uh, this is from the University, I think, of uh, Tabriz, Iran, and from Alabama. <coughs> Anatomy of the Falcine Venus Plexus. Beautiful paper. They show you the channels that connect the severe surgical sinus and the inferior surgical sinus. Beautiful. Look at this. The forks and the connections. Different shapes and sheets of this fun sign. This is the folds, anterior, the posterior, the interior, the cerebral line. And look at these channels. Important, because sometimes you need to open the folks. And if you don't know this, you will put your patient into trouble, if not death. This will be from the American Journal of Neuroradiology, 2010, showing you for sign sinus with normal sinus. I'm showing you Falcine sinus with rudimentary transfer sinus. So this is the Falcine sinus, rudimentary transfer, rudimentary uh, straight sinus. This is duplicated Falcine sinus too. Uh, this is the inferior sagittal sinus draining into Falcine sinus. So you have so many variations. Another paper about persistence of Falcine sinus from India. Uh, we, in this part of the world, think of the Indians as, as uh, <coughs> not up to it, but they are very, very advanced, ahead of us, actually. And we should have a, a huge respect for their uh, people and doctors and surgeons. They are very, very... Ahead of everybody, actually. Hmm? Ahead of everybody. Absolutely. Cutting edge. I mean, the list, the list yeah. IT information is in the front of India. The problem so, is the, uh, the shared medications. Not, uh, so, for science, science, this is the science. Please remember this, especially in children. It's very important. Look at this. No state science, just for science, science. Persistence. As I said, it can be associated with so many abnormalities. So, when you see for science, science, Look what other type of normalities, called vasculosal agemesis, uh, intifalusi, Albert syndrome, uh, which is uh, this, uh, joint dactyly and uh, addition of the suture problem, giant parietal foramina, Arnold Kayari, AVM, and endless volcano gallon. Some examples, abnormal individuals with this suture problems, and called vasculosal agemesis, associated with AVM. 
and children with Landers in the name of Galen. Straight sinus, straight sinus, as you can see. Persistent for sunshine for sunshine from Korea. You see it here as a dot, but if you look at it here you will see it quite clear. So this is causing some obstruction and you would get the falsansinus. Falsansinus is due to obstruction, thrombosis, venous thrombosis. So it could be normal individual, it could be abnormal diseases or diseases. Remember it can be in normal people. So <coughs> our case for today is this unusual parafalsine, parasegetal motor strip in Legion. And this is the images of this lady. Parasegetal, parafalsine. There's no obstruction of the sinus, <coughs> but you look at the veins here. You have to study them, because it's important. So what could that be? Any suggestions? Our radiologist first, Thurman. First of all, we have to look for T2 rating. Sure, no, we will, we will uh, <laughs> put the whole images later on, but what would you think of when you see this? The first impression for all, this is a parasitic term in the Yes, the first impression. But uh, if you look for T2 rating, it's an intra-axia. And then yes. the diagnosis could be primary or metastatic. Okay. Any other suggestions? Residents and neurosurgeons, anybody? Okay. Let's see what's the differential diagnosis. Of course, the first one, when you say parasitical, it goes in an angiom. So, Brazilian, pituitary adenoma, and so on. So, meningioma is the first choice. And I choose to put my cases for you. This is meningioma, very much like our case, right? Exactly, parasitical, parasitical. But these meningiomas can come in different shapes. Again, these are my cases, cystic meningiomas. Cystic meningioma is a grade one. Meningioma grade two. Meningioma grade three. Parasitic. And this Yemen girl. Historically proven. So we're not talking nonsense here. We're talking about proven cases. Cases that have been rated and the strategy is very fine. Rhabdoid meningioma, which is great three cancers, malignant meningioma. Idiopathic hypertrophic pachy meningitis and look like meningioma. Hemangiopericytoma can look like meningioma. A wing sarcoma of the dura, very much like meningioma. Plasma cytoma, plasma cytoma. Solitary, not multiple myeloma. Histologically proven. Astrocytoma, grade 1 or grade 2 or grade 3. Parasitical, and they are dural based. Glioblastoma. And glioblastoma, not my patients. Again, we have no soma, look at this. I mean, this is a patient before and after, and this is the histology. Another JVM, before and after histology. Same thing with this tumor. Or oligo is the diameter, not astrocytum, but oligo. Again, based on the midline and broad base and so on. This is only the endoglioma of this lady I played upon some, some time ago. Oligoendoglioma. Oligoastrocytoma, mixed oligoastro. Ganglioglioma. Parasagita, parafalsine. D-nets. This is plastic. Phoenix. Finally, we have to do a tube. 
Επιτελμό είναι η ξένα. Επιτελμό είναι. Πάρα σε αυτό το τέλο, να κάνουμε έναν γιο. This one, the name of my patients, for the Holy Lord made patient with this tumor. I've never thought that this could be a demonic cause. It's logically proven. Metastasis. Metastasis, maybe parasitical parafusion, yes. Why not? Again, one of my patients. Remember, the old teaching that metastasis usually are small. If you see large, it is not usually metastasis. No. This is metastasis. Huge metastasis from breast. Cavernoma, parasitical, parasitical. Patient I operate a woman, this is a queen Rania visiting her in hospital before and after surgery. Intracerebral hemorrhage. ABM, parasitical. Superior surgical. This is the most dangerous situation where people think that this is a tumor and they operate upon it. Operate on a venous sign thrombosis, patient will die. Did I see people operating? Yes. In Jordan? Yes. And they just get away with it. No accountability. You can do any crime you like. In fact, abscess, tuberculoma, single or multiple, parasitic. Tuberculoma. All these are my patients. None of them from books. Uh, this is sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis, parasitical parasitic. Yes. Parasitosarcosis, <coughs> parasitical. And this another very awkward situation. Multiple sclerosis. We think of multiple sclerosis as a plaques, which is better than treatment. They can come like a tumor. Okay? Lymphoma, tumor, parasitic, why not? Leukemia, glamorphic sarcoma, vasculitis, parasitic, radiation necrosis. How many times we thought of this as arcanus? Why it is radiation necrosis? So, the differential diagnosis of a parasitic lesion is very wide. And you have to know it. Stop playing daft about it saying this is red, it will not come. It will come. Don't expect that only certain cases will come to you. Any comment, please? So rare things, when you see enough cases, they you'll see enough of them. <coughs> um, these are actual cases. This is not a mental exercise. I cannot stress this enough. Um, yes, the first thing one would think of would be Munchion. And the crime would be to radiate, radiate this without getting tissue diagnosis and burying the evidence with it. Because if you miss, um, if you miss Ewing and you radiate it first, the patient will actually miss an opportunity of being cured. So this is a very rare site for Ewing sarcoma and it can happen. When you see enough of those, you'll see them. And the main say of treatment would be multimodality, intensive chemotherapy, uh, surgery, radiotherapy and then more chemotherapy and the course of chemotherapy would go on for a year. Plasma cytoma, uh, the prerequisite would be that you've ruled out multiple myeloma, the bone marrow is negative, there's nothing systemic, and these patients would be radiated, uh, would be cured with radiotherapy alone. They won't need surgery, they won't need chemo. Uh, gliomas, if they're low grade, they need surgery, plus minus uh, uh, radiotherapy, you can, you can delay the radiotherapy until progression you can use chemotherapy later on when they fail both. And with a high grade, you need surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy with and after the radiotherapy. Um, when you get in the glioma, sometimes you can do chemotherapy after the uh, surgery, delaying the radiotherapy, or vice versa, the outcome would be the same. Um, PNET is treated the same as Ewing sarcoma. Again, this is a rare site for PNET. The mainstay would be multi-agent chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy, and then more chemotherapy for a course that would last for a year. And I cannot emphasize the importance of not missing metastases. Um, they can be small, and if the patient is not examined, then you just operate upon this, or so risk to read it, uh, read it. because nobody bothered to, for, to examine the breast, that's really a crime. 
Uh, I can't emphasize the importance of not uh, neglecting a diagnosis of metastasis because the lesion is, is big. Uh, definitely they can present in any way, shape, or form. Um, as a hematologist, not as an oncologist, um, metastasis <laughs> thrombosis is, is a medical emergency and it has to be treated promptly and definitely they should not be subject to full surgery. Uh, is Dr. Montessor in the room? No, but we cannot uh, emphasize enough the importance of not missing tuberculosis in the country of the world or the region of the world that is still endemic, nor abscesses, nor mucous sarcosis. Um, um, now, lymphoma in this part would be either a, a parenchymal or meningeal involvement of the systemic lymphoma that you know that is present, or it would be primary sinus lymphoma. This is not how primary sinus lymphoma is present. But when you see enough of those, you see this mode of presentation. The import importance of this, these patients would be, the main of treatment would be high dose methotrexate. No surgery, no radiotherapy. You delay both until you really need them. And surgery would be resorted to if there is impending herniation. Radiotherapy would be resorted to when they fail methotrexate. Uh, granulocytic sarcoma is not a sarcoma. <coughs> it's a leukemia in an extramedullary site, and it's treated exactly like an acute leukemia, an AMS. This would be heavy multi-agent chemotherapy uh, that is my related. This is as intensive as chemotherapy gets, short of uh, 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 transplant. Actually, transplant is kind of easier because you rescue the marrow with, uh, with stem cells. In, in, uh, in AML, you have to wait until the marrow recovers. Um, we keep hammering these points. These are actual cases. These are actual <coughs> cases. Is it questions? Please, any questions, please? Um, okay, all previous uh, differential diagnosis, uh, we will keep in my, my, our mind, but there is a region, it could be lymphoma, it could be granular, uh, granular, granular, sure. okay, but it, is, it needs surgery, so I cannot know if it is lymphoma or other, other things that no need for surgery, if I will not do surgery. No, you can tell it is lymphoma or leukemia by doing your blood tests. That's why we are against the so-called package deals. These are crimes against the community. Because if you take a case and say to the patient, I'll take five or $10,000 from you and I will cover everything for you, you will do the minimum of investigations. You will not do bone marrow. You will not do CBC. You will do nothing. And then you go for surgery. So you can. If you can't, then you can't take a biopsy. Oh, yes, sir. I, 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 I also, there is a lesion uh, making compression on thin midline shift, increased intracranial pressure. Sure. I will go for, not for tissue diagnosis, for biopsy, then I will... I will. No, no, don't mix things. Yes, no. Don't, I'm mixing things. First page with the middle page with the last page. Your question was pertaining to the lymphoma. We said that you can diagnose it before going to surgery. But if you have a patient with herniation and he just sits there, if there is herniation, then you'll go for surgery. Okay. Any other comment? Please. Okay. Uh, radiation necrosis is very important and crucial for us. For, for, uh, uh, I'm Bilal Hawari, a radiation clinical oncologist, uh, uh, ex-army now working at uh, private sector. Uh, radiation necrosis, we usually face this after the radiation of an area where the the uh, the fifty percent of the radiation dose is the brain involved by it. So when we face this, uh, some of the doctors I have a patient from Iraq. They send it for us for brain metastasis from after treatment of mesopharyngeal carcinoma. I say mesopharyngeal carcinoma usually will relapse. It's relapsed locally in the nasopharynx or in the cervical lymph nodes or metastasized to the lung. So this is not the area of when uh, Dr. Kakish, uh, Dr. Michel Kakish, he said this is a radiation process to <coughs> the patient because they was going to operate. The option was, do you want to radiate this patient or will you go for surgery? None of this, because this is a radiation process and it's very important. Thank you for this slide. And radiation necrosis, mind you, can occur within weeks, months, or years. Yes. I have seen radiation necrosis after 18 years of radiation. 
last thing you need to do for irrigation of the is to irrigate the <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, our case. Remember this? 64 year old female lady from Iraq. And recently, people coming from Iraq, you get suspicious about the diagnosis because they have been subjected to so many uh, weapons of mass destruction. While in Iraq, 2007, she had a left breast carcinoma. Again, history of left breast carcinoma does not mean that this is automatically a metastasis, but we have to mention it to you. So, 2007, breast carcinoma, mastectomy, chemotherapy. The main blood she then came for checkup in 2012. She was seen by Victoria Asuhun, Sina Asuhun, and she diagnosed that in a small young metastasis. Not very active, but expected to give chemotherapy, so she gave her chemotherapy. June. Was, was, was this biopsy done with metastasis? Uh, no, it wasn't. No. I'm just mm -hmm. mentioning it because out of. Out of uh, she, she was in scan at all at that time, just alone. Yes, absolutely. Because <coughs> it's very bad in that when it's close to the lung. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, so <coughs> June, which is recent, 2019, <coughs> she had left sided weakness. And what did the people in Iraq said? Oh, this is just old age. That's why she has left sided weakness. Might just like a stroke. Stroke is a disastrous diagnosis, which is <coughs> used just to, to go cover our ignorance <coughs> and our lack of knowledge. <coughs> Left side of weakness, and then she started having four procedures and incontinence of urine. So this, with this, you diagnose that this parasitic lesion. Her left side of weakness increased, and she fell in her left shoulder. Past history: diabetes, hypertension, hysterectomy due to uncontrolled vaginal bleeding, 2001. Glasgow common scale: 15 over 15. Mind you, 15 over 15, and she's having severe left-sided weakness. Again, showing the limitations of a Glasgow coma scale. Nurses think that 15 over 15 is normal. No, you can be hemiplegic and 15 over 15. Why? Because we get the best response. As well, right side, left side. Right side is normal. We take the right side. We ignore the left side. So this lady is 15 over 15, and she's having severe left-sided weakness. She may have had pupil changes and so on. Vital signs were normal, ophthalmology was normal. Two over five power upper limb, one over five lower limb. She came to my clinic in a wheelchair with this. She could not move her leg at all, a little bit of movement in her left arm. CBC bleeding time, kidney functions, liver functions, normal, electrolytes, normal. Images, without contrast. You can see here, salsai, gyri, I will see, you don't see it here. Immediately you would say there is something here, something wrong. Contrast, very well defined contrast, very much related to the urine. T2, as Dr. Marvante, again you can see the extensive edema, which is going down in front and everywhere. There's some restriction. Corona. That's why I wanted the technicians to be here. And I hope that uh, people here would pass the message to them. Why the hell you put this letter here? Because the pathology is, could be here. So no writing on the image. It's a bad image. It's a bad thing to do. It means that the technician is out of control in that department. As simple as that. Nobody is supervising him or directing him or asking him to do the right thing. Look at this. The pathology could be here. Where did you write on this? H. Hospital. I don't know. Coronal, parasitic, parasite, well defined. You can tell that the severe sinus is, is patent. 
again, P to the power of 1, why? The pathology could be in any part that maybe you put your letters. The same thing here. And another disaster. You ask for, you ask for uh, MRA. What, what would you get? MRA and MRV on top of each other. Again, the technician is out of control. Nobody is supervising him, and he's doing whatever he likes to do. And most likely, he was trained in another stupid place and came to a certain hospital. MRA is different from RV. They should be separate. So this is the MRA. This is the MRA and MRV together. And this is the MRV. Again, here you have to start this area well, because this is where you are going to operate. So we did a few consultations. First thing, when she came to my clinic, I consulted with Dr. Ala. And Dr. Ala uh, took her history, and he knew that she had the breast cancer, and uh, somebody treated her for testis, so he asked for investigations. He asked for just CT. You want to comment? Huh? Or do you want me to yes, comment? Yes, uh, go ahead. I'm going to comment. Okay. So these are the small, they were called small fibrotic non-active metastases. 2000 and so was five, six years ago. And she survived. Abdomen and the, and the pelvis were normal. So Dr. Allah asked for technician scan, which was reported by Dr. Abdel Latif. Is Dr. Abdel Latif around? He asked him to come over, he did it. But basically he said, no clear evidence of any bone metastasis. So again, not because she had to see a breast, sometimes the past that this lesion is metastasis. We have to verify this. You want to comment on that? Yes. So um, I've had the pleasure of seeing this lady as a second opinion, and um, they, nev they did not have any of the original uh, uh, documents with them, despite me asking for them numerous times. Now, but this lady had a... Uh, a HER2 positive, ER positive uh, 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 breast cancer, which means that she had a lot of options after, as adjuvant after the end of her surgery. So she was on hormonal therapy. And when she was labeled as having a, a, a pulmonary recurrence that was not biopsied, as you have pointed out, Dr. Hassan, uh, she was placed again on, uh, on um, trastuzumab, which is a reasonable thing to do. And she was maintained on trastuzumab without actual follow-up of these lesions, despite slight progression of them. Now, it is conceivable for metastatic lesions in the era of uh, heterodirected therapy to remain uh, under control because you have more options for them. But it's really important to know whether these lesions um, are metastatic or no, because these have improved <coughs> a lot of the treatment. One, we not only biopsy the pulmonary lesions to make sure that they're breast related, you want to know the hormonal status and the HER2 status, did it change on recurrence or no? Because 10%, 10 to 20% of cases upon recurrence will switch the, flip the signature from ER positive to ER negative or HER2 positive to HER2 negative. And so what we asked for was to repeat the CT scan compared with the last one to see if there's any progression. And the regular thing is a, a, a simple bone scan that had not been performed for the previous two years. Um, um, but biopsying the, the metastatic, as you have pointed out, Dr. Hassan, is not only important to recommend your recurrence or metastasis. It's actually, in the world of breast cancer, it's really important to know, did they flip the signature from ER positive to, uh, uh, or HER2 positive to negative, because that has severe implications upon treatment. Uh, this is the other scan. Uh, patient as she visited Dr. Sanasafan five years ago, she was also, she wanted to see her and you know, she said, this is a long case to me. Uh, she was treated by Mildex, one of the gram, one of the by one. Is this an inefficient chemotherapy agent for lung metastases? No, a hormonal therapy alone a for hormone. lung metastases is not something I would do. Uh, we asked Dr. Maurice Dahmeli to see her. Why? Because she had four conceivable one, and because she is going for surgery, and she may have further procedures. 
Uh, I published a paper about 30, 34 years ago about epilepsy after cranial surgery and compared the epilepsy after aneurysm surgery uh, with other patients. The incidence of epilepsy after cranial surgery ranges from 3% to 87% to 100% if you have an abscess. So what the tumor is to see here, in this which is integrity all, and keep. We asked the tumor to come. He could not make it. We asked the doctor, when I took him to come to see her, he says, you know, my micro normal, so basically, he's a low risk for surgery. And Dr. Muhammad Juma seen her because she's going to be put on a high dose of steroids and her diabetes would flare up, so he was consulted. And uh, Dr. Juma does not believe, as I do, I do not believe in the sliding scale of insulin. This belongs to the past, and nobody is anymore using it. But still, we are living in the past, using it. So for us, as an anesthetist, in this uh, hospital, he's the chief anesthetist, he said the patient is ready for general well, anesthesia. Well, Remember, this is, yes. this is an old lady, she is almost hemiplegic, and she is real risk. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Fawaz. I'm an anesthesiologist working at Farah Campus. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ibrahim. I can't thank you enough again and again uh, for your informative lectures. Uh, I just want to stress out uh, about the parasagittal uh, tumors or masses uh, for my fellow anesthetists uh, and people who work in the theater. Whenever I see the word parasagittal, to be honest, uh, I get really scared and mortified. Uh, the implications for anesthesia is not only uh, preoperatively but also intraoperatively. That's why we have to know our anatomy as well as the neurosurgeons. Uh, this lady had a, a mass close to the uh, <coughs> superior sagittal sinus. So you would expect uh, massive bleeding. And then these sinuses actually they are not collapsible. So if uh, one of these sinuses actually is open intraoperatively, that means we are uh, bound to have uh, a massive air embolism. So uh, we have to be aware and we have to be knowledgeable about uh, our anatomy. And as you can see, this lady was a very complex case. And I would like and I appreciate what Dr. Ibrahim is doing and what he's teaching us every day about multidisciplinary team meetings and consultations. Thank you. What are the challenges in this case? Parasagittal, what about, we don't know the lesion yet, we don't know the pathology yet. Is it meningioma, is it uh, whatever? <coughs> what are the challenges of being in the parasagittal area? <coughs> you may end in death on table, you may end with hemiplegia or on a ventilator. The position of the lesion, is it anterior part or middle part or posterior part of the subjectal sinus? Whether or not there is edema, like in our case, whether there is a sinus invasion, whether there is a brain invasion, whether there is a vascular invasion. And vascular here means veins. So this is game of veins, or game of thrones, if you like. You see this uh, TV series, game, in the game of thrones. This is the game of veins. Position, is it in the anterior part, or middle part, or posterior part? Each has its own challenges. Or it is at the junction of the uh, digital sinus and the transverse sinus. You may present a uh, case of Falcotentorium in Joma in the coming future. What is the relation of this lesion to the pyramidal tracts and the sensory tracts? And here comes the value of navigation, which I will allude to. Edema, because edema will not allow you to do dissection. You would not see the structure as well. And you could see, in our case, extensive edema. So this is really a challenge. This is our case. Look at the edema. Look at the vein almost bursting with edema. And what is more, there is this vein coming this way and running parallel with the superstitial sinus. This is the superstitial sinus. And why is that edema? Why is there so much edema? So this is the midline, right side, left side. This is the brain edema, and this vein, congested vein, going <coughs> this way, this vein, joins this vein, and they go 
parallel to the sinus. And the lesion is here. How can I get in? How come there's so much edema? The lesion has put it. It's just because of yes. the obstruction. And if you see, no, we, we show that there's no superior sagittal sinus obstruction. This is intrinsic caused by the lesion, edema of the brain surrounding the lesion. And if you see such a thing, uh, you think of bad things. Metastasis, abscess, glioblastoma, and so on. I chose to put this paper by my friend Roberto Hiros. Roberto is from Cuba. He's in Miami. He's a famous surgeon. He's visited Jordan many times. And I'm quoting him here. Venus sacrifice combined with the brain retraction is associated with major brain injury. World Neurosurgery 2013. <coughs> Brinko Dolans from Ljubljana, Slovenia. Again, a friend of very much friend of mine. Uh, all the veins should be preserved during surgery for whatever brain pathology you do. What do we teach our residents? On vein. Who, who, who cares for a vein? Veins are nothing. Veins are Canadian. They are nice. <laughs> they don't do anything for you. You coagulate and they do nothing. But then six, eight hours after surgery, in the early hours of the morning, the patient is unconscious and hemiplegic. He will go out talking and doing everything. <coughs> Although he flipped some of his veins. Six, eight hours, you will have a disaster. So sacrifice of any of the circle group of veins in the middle of the sinus is calling for a disaster. So when you have an obstruction, these veins are very important. So this is these are the sagittal and this is the tumor and this is the tumor. Veins, they sometimes run through the tumor without you know. So I think they are on the surface? No, they can go through the tumor. So you have to dissect them like we did here. This is the sinus. The region was here and this vein was dissected. How do you dissect it? You dissect the arachnoid and make it relax. Can you do this with the naked eye? No. This is a microscopic surgery. Are there still surgeons in the world using this surgery without microscope? Oh, yes. In Jordan, in the Arab world, and in this area of the world. Look at this vein, which, like in our case, is going to vein joining, and then they are parallel to the sinus. But you can dissect this and then find the space so that you would go in. Can you do more to preserve these veins? Yes. And the paper is from Italy. Venus sacrifice in neurosurgery new insights by injecting endocyanine green video injury. What is this? Endocyanine is <coughs> IV injection that as you are working, the anesthetist will give it to the patient and your microscope has, you have installed in it this uh, program, and then you switch the lights of the microscope and you see the veins like this. Beautiful technique, which is used in uh, aneurysm surgery. Dr. Mukafi just came from China, yes? Yes. And Dr. Jahan from Finland is there. Does he use this technique? Sure. So this is a routine thing in aneurysm surgery, and it should be <coughs> Uh, actually popularized in other surgeries. Another complication that nobody thinks about is mutism after removal of anterior fossil region. Oh, how come? This is on the right side, the speech area is here, and people get out to mute. Because here we have the so-called supplementary motor area. People don't think about it. Anatomy, the brain is not taught in this part of the world. They are told to take discs out, to put screws in, to put chunks in. So we got their consent. Again, detailed consent, the detail for the patient, condition. There is no universal consent form. How many times did we say this and we keep repeating this? Everything that the patient has is different from any other patient. And the signature, of course. Wali and the And we use navigation. We have the navigation people here, Sayyid Hamzin, and Sayyid Nasir, Nasir Jarar, and Sayyid Hamzin from Ziyad Saleh. We use this navigation for this purpose. We are on the motor strip. 
we have we know our anatomy, but we need something more to give us confidence, especially with the veins that we are gonna face. Again, this vein joined by this vein, both running parallel to the sinus, and there is this another vein also running. The other is here, and the, the brain is in this. So let's see the surgeon. exactly where I'm going. So I have to relax this vein by cutting the arachnoid around it. If you don't do this, the vein would be stretched. But if you take the arachnoid around it, then you can mobilize it. So I'm mobilizing the arachnoid, moving it so that the vein would be mobilized. You cannot do this with your naked eye. You need 12-15 magnification. So there where the vein goes into the sinus. So what to do? The Demeter's brain, vein obstructing your view, and this is the norm in the middle of the sinus. You will always find this bad arrangements of veins, and you have to be ready for it. Residents and young and surgeons think, oh, parasitical, it's easy. It's under the surface, no. So, I'm trying to go here. I cannot mobilize more. I'm trying to go in here. Let's see whether we can succeed and what do we find. The brain is pulsating. We have given everything. And then I would not start screaming at any stage, oh, you are bad, any status, I have brain edema. There is a major region here. The research has nothing to do with it. Lots of neurosurgeons, mediocre neurosurgeons, young neurosurgeons start screaming at the anesthetist. Anesthetist has nothing to do. Your technique is bad. Behave yourself and act quickly. So this is the main. Again, running parallel to the sinus. That's tumor. No, this is a vein. <laughs> no, 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 no. The tumor is inside. Right. It is inside the uh, cortex. So it is not extensive. I'm just still trying to find out. Now I'm trying to retrieve the brain. I'm seeing the folks. There's no region outside. So this lesion is intrinsic. So I executed the immediately in general. And I put the navigation, and I knew that I'm in the exact position. I covered this vein, and I'm working between this vein and this vein. And you can see the tumor, a vascular tumor, very vascular. And vascular tumors are usually metastatic, usually. When I see visitors like this, look at these veins coming from the folks to the tumor. The worst metastasis to bleed are the thyroid and the colon. They bleed like hell. The worst ever is the thyroid. So there's no good plan of the cleavage, although you have seen that the region is well defined, but here there was no good plan of the cleavage. And you have to remove the tumor piece. My peace. Are there still neurosurgeons in Jordan and in the board and this part of the world that put their finger and take the whole thing out? Yes. Because they are careless, they are not trained, and they are mediocre. So, step by step, you want to remove. Remember you are on the motor strip. Here is the arm area, here is the leg area, and the urine incontinence control area. So whatever you do can damage the patient. Notice that I'm stopped using the tractor here. I want to put the patient the best chance possible. Here is starting to reach to the white matter, but still you have to cut the blood supply coming from the forks. It will continue to bleed till the end. So whenever there is a bleeding, I know there is still a tumor. I would not stop. So when there is a bleeding, it means that there is still a tumor. <coughs> Patiently, this is uh, as far as the metastatic breast carcinoma, 
but I have two comments, very important comments, about breast carcinoma metastasis. Uh, actually, when I was a fellow at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, I did uh, a very good uh, uh, um, project about the prognosis of metastatic breast carcinomas. Metastatic breast carcinomas, when it goes to the lung, it is the worst. Usually, the average survivor was six months. So I was very much astonished when they said that she has, at 2012, she had lung metastasis, and now 2019, she's still living. It's, of course, wrong. This is not a lung metastasis, because lung metastasis, they don't survive for seven years. It, it, astonishingly, the best survival in metastasis is when it goes to the bone. And it, some patients with bone metastasis breast, they live 10 years, while lung metastasis is the worst, is six months. Brain metastasis is, is better than lung metastasis, is two years. So I got to know firsthand or my, 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 with my uh, project uh, how really tumors they behave. So this patient has, if this really has lung metastasis, which was not biopsied in 2012 and treated as lung metastasis, this presumably was not a lung a tumor because it has been a lung tumor for some seven years. Uh, the other things I want to mention, the other comment is that uh, not all tumors, they go to the brain. Not all malignant tumors, they go to the brain. The most common malignant tumor in females that go to the brain is breast. The most common in males is uh, lung and then colon. But other tumors, other malignant tumors, they don't go to the brain. Yeah, like what Dr. Bilal mentioned, meningeal pharyngeal carcinoma, usually they don't go to the brain. So you really have to know the behavior of your uh, malignant tumor uh, before you calling it metastatic to the brain. Uh, th this was case. This case was sent uh, to the frozen section, and I knew that she had breast cancer, so I called it immediately that this is metastatic breast carcinoma. You can see how this uh, tumor is arranged in a cribriform pattern with a gland formation. Again, you can see how the tumor is arranged in cribriformity with necrosis, and this is the tumor from trichoform glands and uh, poorly differentiated. Again, you can see the glands here. And here, there's mucinous component here. You can see very clearly that this, this tumor is producing mucin. Again, you can see the mucin and uh, that these are the cancer cells. Uh, this tumor uh, has, uh, was estrogen positive with 20% and progesterone positive about 50%. Uh, Her to new uh, is negative in this tumor. You can see uh, this is very important for all people that uh, a little or heard about her to new. Her to new has, you can see this is this is the, the uh, positivity. But when you want to call something her to new positive, it has to be complete membranous pattern. Yani all the cell has to be completely a, a positive. And you can see there is almost no cell or very few cells that are positive completely. Yani and this cell is positive from this side and this side, but negative on this side. So we cannot count this cell. It has to be 10% of the cells completely in membranous pattern positive. This this case, you don't see a, a very rare, okay, the only, this is in one cell that's positive, but much, much less than 10%. So this is it's considered uh, uh, plus one, and this is considered negative uh, in her to new uh, staining. So she did convert. Hmm? So she, she did convert. She was positive. She was positive. Was positive. This patient was not positive. Well, this well, was patient was not positive. Was positive. With this patient, six years I, ago. I don't know about the, the years ago, but I know that in this case, this patient should see, for example, this case, this membrane is not completely no, no, I understand. Yeah, I'll comment upon this. Yeah, yeah, it's it's common to change. There are two things in her to new. There are two things important for pathologic, um, quote, about pathological points. One thing that they can change, the other thing her to new is heterogeneous. So it can be in one area that was positive originally, but the metastasis. The metastasized part is not positive. So you, you, you want, it's, it's very well known, everything you want staining can be heterogeneous. So the breast, it has to be really in, in good selected size to when you do hair to new staining. But this again, I just want to, this is for teaching purposes. For example, this is, you, said, you see the membranous pattern, but this is not a complete same membranous pattern. This is negative. Or this is another one, it's, it's negative from here. So this, these are not considered uh, positive. We have hair to new, either zero or one, these are negative. Two is equivocate, two 
when you have 10% of the cells would might to moderate cell membrane staining better, it's free when it is strong and complete in more than 10% of the cells. This is very, very crucial because time and time again prove this is a, a very of a great value. Case 7 was in this case about 25%. Uh, this is complete, but uh, I'll show you. This is one of the examples, not in this case, complete staining button of positive hertenium. You can see it's more than 10% of the cells, and it's surrounding the whole cell membrane. Uh, I just want to tell you uh, uh, some notes, about very important notes, but from a very short point of view, classification of breast tumors. Not all, not all breast tumors, they behave the same, because we at least <coughs> have five, class, five different types of breast tumors. Some of it depends on the hormone receptors, estrogen and progesterone, we classify them. It depends on the heart new, heart to new status. Uh, if, a, if a tumor is negative for estrogen, progesterone, and heart new, we, these are usually basal uh, tumors, and we call them triple negative. Yeah, they're negative in all uh, heart new ER and BR. And they behave differently. I will show you some studies in this one. And it's very important to do proliferation genes, which are the key 67 in these cases. Uh, hormone receptor driven tumors, why it's important? They represent majority, two thirds about of breast tumors. They are classified as luminal. When it's ER, PR positive, classified as luminal. It depends on how much uh, ER and PR uh, expression. The more ER expression, the more PR expression, the better the prognosis in this patient. The lower probably count not to be luminal A, going to be luminal B. Luminal can be A and B. And and estrogen and yes, estrogen and progesterone. Uh, they can, uh, yeah, they are heterogeneous, could be a heterogeneous group uh, regarded of what, uh, and we are divided, they are divided into luminal A and luminal B. Luminal A is the best prognosis in all breast cancers. Luminal B, they don't uh, behave in a good back fashion. So it's very important, and they are differentiated according to the percentage of ER positivity, BR positivity, and the uh, case seven. Case seven is very important in these cases. And they are divided, I mentioned, by uh, 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 T7, uh, biofresh activity and percentage. So breast cancer is not one tumor. You have to know everything about it to, to really know the prognosis. Uh, very important things also, you have to know about ERBR. BR actually is not uh, helpful for treatment. BR is helpful for prognostic value. So we do ER for treatment, estrogen receptor for treatment. But BR, we, we do it for prognostic value. If the BR positive, this is carrying better prognosis than BR negative. But treatment wise, it will not change. So if ER positive cases, BR negative, uh, negative likely to respond to aromatase inhibitors than to moxifene. This is important. Depression is response to chemotherapy. Uh, we define them. Uh, the more ER positivity, positivity, the better response to endocrine therapy. But the more the BR positivity, the better <laughs> prognosis. A very important thing about VR, if you have a case that is VR positive, it has to be ER positive. Actually, this, this simple piece of information is not known by many even oncologists. And I was in a, a meeting like a, one week ago, and one oncologist asked what are what the prognosis of VR positive cases, ER negative cases. Uh, are, these actually cases very, very rare, and uh, usually there's something mistake because uh, BR has to be positive, when they are positive, ER has to be positive because in the, they are in the same um, bad way. Yani you cannot get BR positivity without getting an ER positivity. This is very important uh, piece of information. And this is a, but also very important, you know how the different breast cancer they be, behave. They are at least five types. So triple negative cancers, ER negative, BR negative, cartoon negative, most of the time they, when they relapse, they relapse in the viscera. And they go to the liver, they go to the brain. This is the usual way of metastasis. Uh, when they are AR positive, the usual way of metastasis is usually in the bone. More, more, the most common types to go to the bone is the ones that are estrogen positive. And you remember in, in my study, they show the best prognosis in bone metastasis they live up to 10 years. So really it's a good prognosis because they are, and they, when they metastasize, they go to different size <coughs> and they a good prognosis size. Hurting you is bad prognosis and they go also to the visceral. This is another very important case. Uh, the blue is the luminal A, the 
الاصفر اليومنال بي البيست يومنال اي اند يومنال بي بلو اند يلو ار اي ار اند بي ار بوزيتيف بس اليومنال بي هاز مور بروفريشن يو كان سي البروجنوزيس تاعهم افتر 10 ييرز دي ار تقريبا 80% اوف اليومنال اي سرفايفين لكن شوفوا البيشنت ذات ار هيرتي نيو انريش دي ار فيري باد دي ار فان اوف ذا وورست البيزل وين دي ار تريبل نيجاتيف وين دي ار تريبل نيجاتيف يعني بي ار بي ار هيرتي نيو نيجاتيف ذا وورست ييرز فور ذيم اللي هم الاحمر ذا وورست ييرز فور ذيم از اب تو 3 ييرز افتر ابعد ثلاث سنوات اذا اف ذي سرفايف ويز اوت ريكرنس دي ويل هاف فيري جود بروجنوزيس ذيس بيسز انفورميشن ار فيري فيري امبورتنت for a clinician to know uh, to, to, because that, that's why we really could different uh, uh, <coughs> emphasize the importance of ERBR for the student. Sam, this is an extremely important slide as you pointed out because it emphasizes that, which I'm going just to say now, is that breast cancer, regardless how limited it is at presentation, it continues to relapse and it relapses late. And even in the best group, the luminal A, they continue to relapse and relapse late. And the uh, the other groups, more than 50%, and when you follow them long enough, they continue to lapse. This pattern of big failures in breast is always there, uh, even in the best of groups. I, I totally agree. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Dr. Hussain. Uh, always great. Uh, uh, my comment is about the lung cancer you mentioned. Uh, you said that uh, this is maybe not a, a lung cancer. <coughs> But you have to put in your mind that this is luminally and it's ER strongly positive at what ta at that time and now. And she was treated for at least five to 10 years with uh, uh, hormonal therapy. She, she, so she was under treatment until she relapsed. So she, she this was on her two directed therapy as well. Yes. But I think Dr. Hassan's point is also well taken. When you usually they fail and they present in the lung, it doesn't remain indolent even on her two treatment that long. And it usually it gives you more trouble. And uh, you'll see exceptions, of course. Usually but when she it will give you more trouble. Uh, 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 right here, Robert, she uh, said uh, she was with lung metastasis and... Uh, let, let me finish. Uh, the, the, the last point I want to mention, one of the clinicians that are caring for the patient, he, he asked about uh, the status of the margins. Mm -hmm. And I think he doesn't know how the uh, biopsies or how the brain resections are taken piece by piece. So really, in the tumors of the brain, brain we cannot assess margins because we receive them in pieces. And I think Dr. Brahim probably will highlight She will need case. radiation therapy because there is a lot of micro-metastasis yeah. in the brain. Okay. So um, again, this slide, um, I'm glad that we stopped here because this, uh, this slide uh, at slot the presentation here. Um, uh, Dr. Hussam spot. Um, this really emphasizes the point I've been making. Breast cancer continues to relapse even when it presents uh, in early stages and it relapses late. It is irrespective of which subgroup you are, even in the best of ones, they continue to relapse and relapse late. And in the, in the, in the, in the worst groups, more than 50% of them are going to relapse. And there's really no plateau on this. They continue to relapse and relapse late. And they want to do a trial uh, have sh uh, with the longest follow up. In, uh, in early stage breast cancer have demonstrated this when you, uh, when you evaluate these long enough. Now, for those, this patient was labeled as HER2 positive at start any of us. And the, there, is, there was emerging data after the introduction of testuzumab in the, uh, in the uh, early part of the millennium that when these patients are followed long enough, uh, they do get brain metastasis. And there's a lot of talk about why that may be. It may be because you're controlling the disease longer and these patients are living longer to the extent that they're getting more uh, uh, chance to get brain metastasis. Now, uh, we did not have the original specimens to uh, review uh, to confirm whether this indeed was HER2 positive or no. But it does not surprise me when they actually flip to HER2 negative when they have a brain metastasis. And the chance of this happening is in 10 to 20% range. The reason why this is really important is that if this is positive, uh, these patients would benefit from oral HER2 directed therapy in, in addition to oral capecitabine, both of which are well known to penetrate the blood-brain barrier, which would have been 
the, what would have been recommended from a chemo perspective, biological perspective for this lady. The fact that the brain lesion is heteronegative is very important because we would not use heterodirected therapy and indeed there would be no reason or rationale to continuing systemic heterotherapy. Uh, this patient will need radiotherapy to the brain uh, to be followed by uh, capsitabine based chemotherapy because of its ability to treat the blood therapy. What makes these people, I mean, the breast and the... Oh, thank you all for your formative uh, talk. But what makes the, uh, the lung and the breast cancer, uh, what enticed them to go to the brain rather than, or more uh, than the other cancers? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, now, what makes certain cancers go to specific parts is an extremely interesting thing. Why do they home to specific areas? A very interesting thing. Uh, breast with the pattern of going to bone as opposed to lung, liver, and uh, and brain. Now, breast is a very common malignancy, so we tend it's the most common in Jordan. It's the second most common in the world. Now, it's second to third. The issue is that you get more metastases because of that number. But even then, that predilection is something to do with the homing of the cells. It gets more complicated when you try to explain something that's even uh, harder to explain. Why would you have things like primary testicular lymphomas that would sub would form to the brain? Why would you get primary sense lymphomas that in a, an organ that doesn't have lymphatic tissue to start with? Why do testicular cancers other than lymphomas metastasize to the brain particularly? It has to do with embryology, histology, where do they home, how do they home, uh, and, the, and the signature. And the short answer is we don't actually understand why do certain, why does follicular lymphoma, uh, why does thyroid cancer in particular home to the bone and the brain? Uh, th those are the questions. It has to do with every cell type, the embryological uh, derivation, the histological uh, signature, <coughs> and the changes in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the behavior of the cell as part of the oncological process. Uh, can we continue with the case? And then we'll continue the discussion. Uh, this is the diagnosis. Finally, this is metastasis from the breast, and possibly this is uh, MRI. Nice to be removed. Of course, still there because this is the second next day of surgery. So, still in Lima. It is immediate. Look at it. It's still in the ICU. She started to move her left side. We discharged her after four days in the hospital. And the discharge ceremony should be complete and extensive, like we do in every case. And we insist that the discharge somebody starts on admission and we finish it just before the patient is close home. <coughs> and I stop at this. We have to respect patients. We have to respect that they are a human being. So follow up my clinic, Saturday, date, certain time, 2 p.m. <coughs> follow up <coughs> Dr. Maurice, Wednesday, date, time, and so on. So so I have to do this for patients because I'm a human being in spectrum. This is her when she came, sitting in a wheelchair and unable to raise or move her left side. And this is how she went back to work. Thank you very much. Uh, Along the sense, it is well known that uh, this can metastasize in the brain. Where was she not? At that time, when they found it in the lung, why was she not scanned for the brain as well? I mean, it you know, it, defeats, it a, defeats my intelligence, as usual. Why are these people are behaving like this? I mean, it's a well known we entity. Have, we have to admit our shortcomings and our, you know, we can't say more. It's surprising. People are needed, you know, need people to learn more and to act uh, according to proper medicine. Proper medicine is not practiced in this part. Any other questions I can ask you? Thank you, Dr. Brahim. Uh, first of all, in this case, it's very important 
to differentiate whether the tumor is intra-axial or extra-axial. Tomorrow, our differential diagnosis, because it's an intra-axial tumor, and our differential diagnosis could be primary metastasis or phenomenal. Second thing is, if it's metastasis or primary tumor, we can differentiate it, not in conventional MRI. We can do complementary uh, perfusion and spectroscopy. In perfusion, we can differentiate between primary and metastasis. Since if we do a relative cerebral volume around the tumor, it's normal in metastasis, but it's very high in uh, the primary brain tumor. Second thing is the M uh, MRI spectroscopy. MRI spectroscopy, choline, and NAA intratumoral and peritumoral is high in primary brain tumor since there is a neuroangiogenesis, uh, neuro but it's normal in metastasis. Uh, I want to, ask, uh, to answer the question by my, my colleague, why there is a massive edema? Uh, because this is metastasis. Since it's, it's metastasis, it's a foreign cell, it's not a real cell, and the active will be very high. Small tumor, very large edema. Well, it's reactionary. Yes. Allow me to attack you on the tumor. <laughs> you just said that we need to do spectroscopy and perfusion. This patient was had higher MRI here. Why did you both not do the spectroscopy? We have three Tesla, and yes. it is equipped with all these facilities. Why are we not using this facility? Because you have to ask it. Because the technician, no, if you don't no. ask, he didn't no. do it. No, of course, I shouldn't. It's routine. We it's can. routine. Because sometimes it's very costly. No, no, no. Uh, I, mean, I don't accept this argument. It is necessary that technicians and people know that this is the routine, the norm that should be done okay. with the three, uh, three Tesla. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you. We'll meet.